thoughts like these came in. We're just going to let you have your seats for a minute. We're done with the musician and song leader. God bless you. Thank you all. I just wanted to talk to you for a minute before we got into the Word, and then we'll stand and read our Scripture and pray. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to remind everybody that this coming weekend, we've got Brother Abraham Myra from Uganda coming in. So if you could just remember that and invite some people to come. Saturday night, two services on Sunday, and then we'll have communion after the second service. So we're very much looking forward to that. It's been a while since he was here. Also, I want to warn you that I got a little bit of a cough today, but it doesn't bother me, so don't feel sorry for me. Amen. Just pray for me. I always like to tell you that because I don't want you to be nervous. Oh, he's coughing, he's coughing. I don't even know I'm coughing. I'm just preaching. Amen. And uh, every once in a while, I get a little sinus or allergy, something or whatever. The devil tries to sin, but we, re we resist it in the name of Jesus Christ. It's got to go by his stripes. We are healed. Amen. And I was thinking this morning, I had that brother lay hands on me and pray for me yesterday, knowing that it's a finished work, amen? And I think this morning that preaching makes it worse. And uh, I thought, so what? <laughs> amen? It's got to go anyhow. And then I was thinking while I was getting ready this morning, the, the brother Benham said when they did, they did some check on him, some test, and they said he had scar tissue in his throat from hard preaching. And he said, I kind of like that. <laughs> I kind of like that. Amen. I got scars, amen, in my throat for proclaiming the gospel. So, amen, if I cough, don't you worry one bit. You just let me blow it out and I'll keep going. I won't even notice, amen. And we'll just keep going. You keep pulling. Amen. Also want to say thank you really quickly for some brothers who were here working yesterday. And you might not notice today, but you'll notice Wednesday night. Uh, they did a couple projects around, but the main one was they changed all the parking lot lights out. The LED lights. We were having some problems with those going bad, and so we want to thank Brother Rich Levy, Brother Dean Hatfield, Brother Jonathan Pittsenberger, and Brother John Brooks for working on some things here yesterday. And I saw them last night, and they're shining bright. So Wednesday night, when you come out of church, you'll see their handiwork. Amen. So we want to thank them. Also, there's another item I want to discuss with you. Over the past, oh, I don't know, maybe four years or four and a half years after I've become pastor, I would get a comment occasionally once in a while from somebody who was a little bit nervous about the cameras, the cameras being in their face, or I've had comments about, you know, I feel uncomfortable with a camera zooming in on me and things like that. And it wasn't a major comment, it was just from time to time I would hear something. So I didn't pay much attention to it because everybody has a different feeling or a different thinking on different things. I hear lots of things about temperature and seating arrangements and <laughs> things like that. So I just wait and see. And, and I'd heard it a couple times, and so I thought I would talk to the deacons, and we sat down and had a meeting, and I said, you know, what's the general feeling? What do we think and what do we feel about this? And we talked, and all the deacons agreed that they felt like it was a problem for those in the assembly, that there was a sensitivity some people don't want to be zoomed in on when they're worshiping the Lord, when their hands are in the air, when they're crying, when they're praying, when they're responding to the word. So <clears throat> we made a decision that we're not going to use the cameras that way anymore. Amen. 
We want people to be free, completely free to worship God the way they desire to worship God. Raise your hands, cry, pray out loud, whatever. We don't want anybody inhibited by anything that we would ever do to inhibit anybody's worship in any way. That's never our desire. So we've, we've decided that we're not going to use the, uh, we're just going to use the back cameras and the side camera for shooting on the platform here or for just a wide shot taking in all the congregation or most of the congregation. No, no longer are we going to use it for zooming up on one person or getting a close shot of somebody while they're worshiping or responding to the word because we want to respect people's uh, privacy. Different people have a different level of comfort on those things. And we want, some people are very private, very intimate with the Lord, and they don't enjoy that. So we want to be sensitive of that. Also, we're not going to use this front camera anymore to, to scan the audience or to try to find those kind of shots. It's going to be turned to the side like it is now, because I know some people had mentioned that I just, I feel like it's coming across and it's going to catch me. And if that's a distraction during the worship service or during the preaching, our mind is going somewhere other than where it should be. And if that's what's happening, it was never intended to be that way, but if that's what's happening, we don't want to do that. So you don't have to think about that anymore. Don't worry about where the eye in the sky is and the all-seeing eye watching you. But it was never intended to be that way, and we never meant for anybody to be uncomfortable, never meant to inhibit anybody's worship. That was never the desire. The desire was just to capture what God was doing, amen? And so we, we but we were listening. Um, but we will still use this front camera from time to time. So if you see it move, don't get nervous. We'll use it for specials, for baby dedications. It'll be used during weddings, maybe sometimes to catch a shot of the minister from behind. Uh, it's during special services. Sometimes I minister on the floor down here for the children's church. We may use it then. Funerals, just different things. We're not going to rip it off and throw it away, but we're going to use it where it's appropriate to use it, but not going to use any of the cameras. We're going to try to respect everybody's privacy, everybody's level of intimacy with the Lord, and not inhibit anybody in any way. So that's, that's our desire. We want to let you know that's what we're doing. And also, I would really like to hear feedback from you. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Because we want to know, is this, is this how do you feel? So you can talk to me, talk to one of the deacons, talk to Brother Franco, or if you feel like it's easier for you to write it down, you can send an email in, or you can write it down and drop it in the suggestion box in the back. But let us know what you think, how you feel, because we want everybody to worship the Lord. We want there to be freedom in the spirit. We want there to be freedom in the sanctuary. We want to respond. We, we want to worship. We want to raise our hands. We want to do as the Lord leads without ever wondering where the camera's at. And so let that leave your mind now and let's enter into the word this morning together. Let's all stand. Let's turn to Malachi chapter one together. <coughs> Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1. We're going to continue on with the same thought we had last Sunday, and the title was The Misunderstood Love of God, and we're going to go into The Misunderstood Love of God, part 2. And man, I pray that you pray for me as I study. The material keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. I intend maybe to carry some of it into Wednesday, but just pray God will deliver it the way he wants it delivered. Amen. Amen. We want to read Malachi 1 again to catch our context. The burden of the, of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Let's just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we pray now as we enter in, Lord, I pray that you would just come down yourself and break the bread of life, that you would come down and minister your word through a vessel, Lord, and God, that the vessel could be laid to the side, Lord, and, and the eyes of man could just get out of the way, Lord, but that you would come down, Lord, and pick up that gift that you placed there and use it, Lord, for the shaping of your lively stones. Pray that you'd feed us today and we would receive all that we have need of. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. You can be seated. So 
Brother Ben talks about this scripture many times, and, and he's saying that they're, they're saying here, God's declaring his love for Israel, and they're asking, how has thou loved us? We didn't recognize or, or, or see your love. And Brother Bram has some things to say about that. We'll get to that quote in a minute. But he says in the message, Hear Ye Him, 1960, like in love, we try to use love, God's love, like we do human love. You cannot fall in love with God like you do your wife. So now he's just going to start breaking down our, our human understanding because the love of God is not limited to just the human experience, amen? It's greater than just a human kind of love for a husband or wife, or, or he begins to show even for a parent to a baby, amen? God's love is a higher form of love altogether, amen? He says, you cannot fall in love with God like you do your wife. You cannot fall in love with God like you do your husband or your girlfriend or boyfriend. It's two different loves altogether. Even in the Greek words are different. One of them is phileo. That's the love you have for your wife. That kind of love would make you kill a man over jealous. But the agapeo love, which is the godly love, instead of killing the man, it make you pray for his sinful soul. That's right. That's how much difference it is. Well, that's a huge difference, amen? That's just not just a minor difference. That's a tremendous difference between the love of God, amen, and a human love, amen. He goes on to say, and we get the human element mixed up with the Christian godly element, and then we just get a mess out of it. That would explain the modern church's thinking, amen? Taking a human love and mixing it up with a Christian or godly love and making a total mess out of the thing. To well now, amen, to have a standard in a church now is considered unloving, amen. To not allow people to divorce at will and remarry and dress however they want and come into the church in any condition, bringing their sin into the church and not have it judged. Now that's considered love. And to judge it and root it out, amen, and condemn the thing and call for repentance or leaving, amen, that is called not loving. And that's the opposite of the scripture, amen, because we've taken the human element and we've mixed it in with the godly element and made a mess of the whole thing. Hallelujah. Because we only know Listen, this is why. We only know by inches, feet, miles, and so forth, by ounces and pounds and so forth. That's all we know. We're in time, people. God's eternal. He has no inches, no miles, no yesterday, no tomorrow. It's all eternity with him. And we try to bring God's great infinite mind down to our little finite mind. And oh, we just get mixed up. So Brother Branham's gonna give us the solution now. So the best thing in doing is reading his word and remember that his word will not contradict itself. How do I get it straight, amen? Because I've got a human love and a human compassion, amen, that's a million miles from God's love. My human love and human compassion could cause me to kill a man over jealousy over my love for my wife or over my love for my children, amen? But God's love is not going to do that. God's love would make me pray for his sinful soul. So now how do I keep it straight between what's the human emotion and what's God's love? There's only one way to keep it straight. Read the word, amen? The word won't contradict itself. Don't go against the word. Hallelujah. If we become tempted to go against the word for human love, amen, then we've missed the love of God. Hallelujah. Let's turn to 1 John together. 1 John chapter 2. I've got so much I want to say today. But we're just going to pray that the Holy Ghost takes his leadership and says what he will. I had started last time in saying three ways in which we can typically uh, misunderstand God's love. And I only got to two of them. And I want to get to the third today. But there's some other things I want to finish up that we left last time. So I don't even know if we'll get to the third one today. But we're going we're gonna to go that direction. And hopefully we will. But 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected or completed or finished. Hereby know we that we are in him. Now, this is a hard saying, but if we will not do his commandments, we can say that we know him. Oh, I know Jesus. I'm in an intimate relationship with him. Oh, I love him so much. But if we don't do his commandments, we don't know him. I mean, this is really important because this shuts down denominational thinking, amen? It shuts it down completely because if you, if, if you do not keep his commandments, you don't know him. He says, he, he that saith, I know him, keepeth not his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Praise God. I say, God, I'm not going to be a liar. I know him. I know him in the power of his resurrection. I know him in the unveiling of his word. And Lord, let me keep your commandments by your grace and by your spirit. Now we go back to this, the scripture of Malachi, we don't turn there, but we're referencing back to Malachi where he says, I've loved you. And he says, wherewith have you loved us? And he says, did not I choose? It wasn't Esau, Jacob's brother, but I chose Jacob. And Brother Bram says in the Smyrna church age, out of the church age book, you see, they could not figure out God's love. Amen, I don't think you're gonna figure it out either, amen. We just accept it as true, amen, and accept it on the basis of his word. They couldn't figure out God's love. They thought that love meant no suffering. They thought that love meant a baby with parental care, but God said that his love was elective love. The proof of his love is election. Hallelujah. Amen, what the most, that's the most liberating thought. I mean, one of the most liberating things I've ever heard because I have no doubt he chose me. I didn't chose him. I didn't come looking for him. He came and found me. He chose me. He revealed his word to me and he put inside me something that could believe his word and respond to it and say that's nothing but the truth. And that's not something that came out of my humanness. That's not something that came out of my breeding between my parents. It's something that came out of that seed that was predestinated before the foundation of the world and I've been elected amen and now I know he loves me regardless of what happens from this day forward it matters not he loves me why because his love is his election amen no matter what happened his love was proven truly by the fact they were chosen unto salvation because God hath chosen you to salvation, get this, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Not belief of a truth, but belief of the truth. Praise God. He may commit you to death as he did Paul. Wait a minute. Look at where Brother Brenham's going here. He may commit you to death as he did Paul. Did he love Paul? Amen, was Paul elected? Was Paul chosen? Was Paul beloved? Amen, was did Paul, was he uh, operating in grace? Amen, was he accepted? Was he loved? Absolutely, without question, amen. He loved him so much that he would lay stripes to him, amen, that he would have people stone him and spit on him and reject him and a whole tumult in the city would rise up all just to snuff him out, amen. That's how much God loved him. Amen. <laughs> It's not like we think, amen, but it's according to his word. He may commit you to death as he did Paul. He may commit you to suffering as he did Job. That is his prerogative. He is sovereign, but it is all with a purpose. Oh, let that anchor into the heart. There's not one thing that you've suffered with that is not for a purpose, amen. It's not just in vain that these things happen to you, that God must approve it. He, it doesn't escape his mind. It's in his knowledge what is happening. He knows it. He understands it. He's ordained it, amen, because it's all for a purpose. Even when you can't see the purpose, it's for a purpose. If he did not have a purpose, then he would be the author of frustration and not of peace. His purpose is that after we have suffered a while, after that, 
we have suffered a while, we would be made perfect, be established, strengthened, and settled. As Job said, he puts strength in us. You see, he himself suffered suffered. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He was actually made perfect by the things that he suffered. And he comes down and he lays an example for us, amen, so that we will, we will follow in his footsteps. Now, I mentioned something before and I just want to spend a little more time with that. And I, and I was explaining or showing that many times there is two approaches to suffering, amen? When persecutions and tribulations and rebukes and all of these things come our way, amen, we, we have two, two ways in which we try to escape those things. And when we look at persecutions, like we, we took the Apostle Paul and began to show that as they would begin to throw stones at the Apostle Paul and, and they would begin to mock the Apostle Paul and beat him, amen, and do all of these things that that there was two responses that you typically find. One is to turn around, pick up a stone, and start chucking it back, amen? Throwing rocks back, but Paul never did that, and Jesus never did that. And the second is to run and escape and hide away, amen, and, and say, you know, if, if they're not gonna listen, I'm not gonna tell them anymore. But Paul couldn't do that, because Paul, amen, Paul, under God's great expression of love, was sent out to deliver the word, amen, not to goats, amen, not to the masses, but the word was going to go out to call the elected, amen, and that's God's love expressed. And so Paul was out there expressing God's love, and God's love kept him in the firing line. God's love kept him in his commission. God's perfect love kept him in the battle. He could not himself run away and hide because love kept him there. Not human kind of love, a human love, amen, come up to Paul one time and there was a prophecy that went forth in the church that says the man that wears this girdle is going to be bound in Jerusalem, amen, and they begin to compel uh, uh, the apostle Paul not to go into Jerusalem. There was a prophecy prophesied in all the churches as he went, you're going to be bound, you're going to be in prison, amen, trouble's coming in Jerusalem. And the human love inside them, though the prophecy was true, amen, the human side took the prophecy and tried to stop the apostle Paul from going down into Jerusalem. And Paul says, what meanest thou this? Thou breakest my heart with thy weeping. He said, I'm not willing just to be bound, but also to give my life. He knew he was commissioned to go to Jerusalem, amen, and human love was trying to stop him. How many times has human love tried to stop us from fulfilling the word, from the commission of the word? Human love has tried to stop us. But Paul was motivated by a love greater than human love. Paul didn't want to separate from the people, and they didn't want to separate from him but there was a greater love that motivated him. <clears throat> I want to take a look at a couple characters in the Bible. If we could turn back to 2 Kings together. I want to look at this principle because Brother Benham was tried by the same trial as Elijah and Elisha. And so I just want to look at that for a minute, Second Kings chapter two. Second Kings chapter two, verse 23. Now, Elisha has seen Elijah go up and he's started into his commission, he's received the mantle, he's crossed Jordan, and he comes back in the ministry, and in verse 23 it says, and he went up from hence unto Bethel, and he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him and said unto him, go up thou bald head, go up thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord, and there came forth two she bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. 
And Brother Branham has some things to say about this, amen? This is a prophet, this is a prophet of God, amen? As he goes up, these little children are starting to mock him, go up thou bald head, <coughs> and Brother Branham said, they're saying that because they didn't believe, the parents didn't believe his testimony that he saw Elijah go up in a whirlwind and got the mantle and got the commission. They didn't believe his testimony, they didn't believe his commission, they didn't believe that he was the bride fulfilling the commission of Elijah. And the parents, amen, amen, and Brother Bram said the children would have never got this idea if they hadn't heard the parents talking at home. Little kids don't, didn't just come up with this idea on their own. They were expressing, amen, what they had been hearing back in the house, amen, the slanderous remarks, the disbelief, amen, of a prophet of God in the ministry of Elisha. And so now he comes up and they start to mock him. And in his anger, he turns around and he curses them. And two she-bears run out and kill 42 of them, tear 42 of these children. And Brother Bram said in the message, behold, a greater than all of them is here. Did you ever think it was the will of God when Elijah, that mighty prophet, bald-headed, and those little children run down making fun of him being bald-headed? Well, what of it? He ought to have just left it alone. He ought to have just left it alone. But under the anger, and that prophet turned around and put a curse on those children, and two sheep bears killed 42 little children, an angered prophet. Is that true? Now listen to what Brother Bram says. You have to be very, very careful. That's the reason gifts are not handed out the way people think they are. See, true gifts of God is sent from God and you watch them. He says in the message, believest thou this, 1960, I never could believe that it was God's will for Elijah to go around because them children was teasing him about being bald headed. I don't think he should have did that, but he was a prophet and he was angered and he put a curse on those children and two she bears killed 42 little innocent children. But don't believe, I, I don't believe he should have done that. God, I believe today, before he puts his church in power, he tries his church to see what it will do. See how he put these things together now? He's showing us that Elisha shouldn't have done that. Amen, because, because Elijah was personally offended. And he was personally attacked, amen? He wasn't defending the word, amen. He wasn't quoting the scriptures. He was personally offended by the attack. And because he was personally offended, he found offense. He turned around and he cursed them. Because he was a prophet, amen, God honored the word of that prophet, even though Brother Bram said that wasn't the, he said that wasn't the Holy Spirit. But God honored that, amen. And, and, and sometimes I think, Brother Ben says, you've got to be careful, amen. This is why gifts aren't given out, amen, because they can be misused, amen, because God will still honor the gift. God will still honor what he's put inside the people, but without character, it can be misused and do a great deal of damage, amen. He said because of the personal offense, he should have left it alone and let it go. And God is testing his church. Sometimes persecutions are coming and, and sometimes comments are made and mockers rise up and it's just God seeing what you and I are going to do about it, amen. Are we gonna take the nature of Christ? Are we gonna our own human nature, amen? That's the problem with human love. Human love has its limits. Amen, it's funny how, how human love could turn to rage and anger in a split second like that. That's how fickle human emotions are. I mean, you can go down and have the most euphoric, lovely feeling about somebody, and you can call them your brother and talk about all their wonderful characteristics, but let them say something evil about you or, or your children or your wife or the church that you go to or, or somebody that you love or you personally, all of a sudden, all that love will turn to anger and hatred, amen, in an instant. But there's got to be, we got to operate from a higher love, from a greater vantage point, amen, seeing God in his word, that maybe that's just done to test you, because power without character is satanic. And so God will put these testings on, amen, and so many times we long for greater manifestations, amen, greater gifts, amen, but God is watching for the character, amen. He'll give a little something and see what's done with it, amen. 
He'll give, he'll give a revelation, amen, just to see if you get puffed up and say, I know something you don't know, and, and I'm better than everybody else, or we're the best church, or we have the best preacher, or we've got the best song service, amen. God forgive us if we've ever thought that, amen, because God will give us a little something, a little fresh revelation, a little fresh manna, just to see what the attitude of the people are. Will we have arrived and start a new camp? Or will we say, God, that was wonderful, I need more. I'm still needy and I'm still hungry and I, I'm still desperate for more. And I, after you showed me that, I still feel like I don't know nothing, amen. That's the right approach, amen. We put gifts in the church, amen, and we start feeling like, oh, we've arrived, amen. There's church with gifts that are marching right to Armageddon, amen. They're marching right to tribulation with gifts manifesting every day. That's no reason to feel like we're something better than somebody else. God will give a little something just to see. And he's not going to give any more until he can see what we're going to do in our personal lives, in the church, amen, there's always testings, there's always, God, this is his great love, that he's always sending testings, amen, and he'll use the rod of man, and he'll use the rod of pestilence, and he'll use whatever tool he wants to use, he's going to use, because what he's trying to do is extract character that's laying in the seed. So that we die to the human side, amen, and we live, amen, by the word manifesting itself in us. Amen, Brother Brenham had to be tested with the same thing. He says in 1962 in the message, the reproach for the cause of the word, he said, and there was just a little snow and he pulled through to get to the camp and he, he pulled into a camp early in the spring and I was standing there talking to Brother Fred, and the Holy Spirit said, go to yourself. And I moved out to the bush a little while, place, he told me, there's a trap set for you. Be careful now. But he didn't tell me how, what. I came back and told Brother Fred, went to church that night in the auditorium, announced it to the people, and the next night it happened. And then standing there when he told me, upon some mockers, he said, it's in your hands. There's some mockers in the church, and he's going to explain what they're doing. There's some mockers in there. In there. It's in your hands. Do with them whatever you say will happen right now. So people sitting right in the front, and they're mocking the service, and they're disrupting the service. And listen to what, listen to what he said they're doing. He said, there you are. And somebody irreverent, ungodly, and they were making fun and scoffing at the meeting. A young man and a young woman, and he was trying to vulgar love make with her in the building and everybody's attention while I was trying to preach. And he pulled her head back and climb up in her lap and throw her head back and try to kiss her and going on like that in the meeting, drawing the attention. And the Holy Spirit said, they are in your hands, what will you do with them? There was a holy hush. Everybody sat deathly quiet, and I thought, oh God, what must I do? I'm so glad to this time that I haven't been put to that test, because likely I would have failed, because likely I would have been offended that you would mock at what I'm preaching, that you would, you would show such little disrespect for me and for our church and for our congregation that I would begin to get red from the neck up to the ears to the top of my head. Am I alone? And Brother Brenham was being tested, amen. He was being tried because he's going to be carrying the most powerful thing that's ever been carried by a human being, and it's the full revelation of the full word of God. Amen, it's got to be delivered, but there's got to be character to handle it. So he's being put to the test. Amen, you think God didn't know the mockers were gonna be there? He said, there's a trap laid for you. Two days before, he knew it was coming. You think God could have stopped it? He could have stopped it. He didn't want to stop it. He wanted his prophet to go through the test, amen. He wanted those mockers to sit right there and cause a distraction and vulgarity, amen, and, and lewdness and attracting the people's attention because God wanted to test his prophet. Hallelujah. Sometimes things happen to us, we think it can't be God. This can't be God. Things happen in the church, this can't be God. Amen. 
And God knows about it. He knew it was going to happen. But he's wanting divine love, which isn't a gushy feeling, emotional thing. Amen. It's adherence to the word. He wants divine love to rise. A holy hush. Everybody said deathly quiet. I thought, oh God, what must I do? Then I remembered, if it hadn't been the warning of the Holy Spirit two days before, I said, I forgive you. And there is witnesses sitting here now, as there then, then the Holy Spirit fell through. He looked down, he could have cursed them. They could have packed them out there in gurneys, or they could have packed them out there in body bags. But he said, I forgive you. And the Holy Spirit fell through. He says, because after all, I've been guilty. Maybe not of that, but guilty. And guilty of the least is of the whole. I said, I forgive you. And there is witnesses sitting here now was there then. Then the Holy Spirit fell through. Now you see, I believe that all these things had a meaning What would you do with a power? How would you see the reaction of an action? Something that has come as an action, then how do you react to the action? Do you understand what I mean? What would you do? And maybe all this has worked up to where we're at now. I don't know, I just can't say, but there's always been some way. And remember, the reproach of the word. The word has always bore a reproach all through the ages. God's anointed word has always been reproached. And that's the reason it's so hard for the people who doesn't understand would know how to accept that reproach. He, he says it's hard for the people who don't understand to accept the reproach. You just accept the reproach. Family members reject you, you accept the reproach. They laugh about the way you raise your children. They laugh about how childish it is that you won't watch a television. They laugh about all these things, but hey, you have to accept the reproach. Not get angry back, but accept the reproach. Take up your cross, follow him. It isn't that you jump up and start, you know, seeing how angry you can yell at somebody and how you can put them in their place and how quickly you can make them feel foolish and make them feel like a sinner. Amen, that's not bearing the reproach. Sometimes you just take it. Jesus bore the reproach for the manifested word of his day. He was the manifested word, and he was nailed to a cross bearing the reproach, and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The people who laugh at you, they don't know what they're doing. The people who make little snide comments, and the people who reject and say words that are blasphemous, they don't know what they're doing. If they knew that this was God in flesh, they wouldn't say one evil thing about it but they don't know it and they don't believe it and they don't know what they're doing. He says, now, can you remember the disciples returning back and rejoicing because they figured that they were counted worthy to stand the reproach of his name? He said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus in Christ shall bear a persecution, the reproach of the word. You always have to stand this reproach in order to give your testing, see? Every man that comes to Christ must first be child trained for the purpose that God has ordained you for. And remember, if you can just keep quiet, that is the challenge. It's not the challenge for everybody, but it's a challenge for some of us. I'm included in that one. If you can just keep quiet, remember, if he has called you for this, there's nothing that can keep it from happening. There's not enough devils in torment, but what God's word will make manifest. You're born for a purpose and nobody can take your place. You might have impersonators, everything else, but they'll never take your place, amen? You were born to be the bride of Jesus Christ. There might be bride impersonators, but that doesn't stop you and I. That doesn't stop us from taking our place, amen? God's word will triumph, it cannot fail. There there is where every Christian ought to stand knowing that and trials will come up and some every way to you. But remember, God has a purpose, and it will all work right. So Brother Branham was tested. He made it come to the place, the sea, because he had that same spirit in him. 
That spirit of Elijah that had come twofold into Elisha and now had gone to John the Baptist and now the spirit of Elias or the spirit of Elijah was now in Brother Branham and it had to be tested, amen? Amen, can he carry it with the New Testament word? Can he carry it with the full revelation of the word? Can, can that spirit, amen, uh, operate by divine love according to the word or is it going to go back to human emotion like it did there? And he passed the test. And I'm thankful he passed the test. I'm thankful that he was given, amen, <clears throat> that God had confidence in him with permission to speak the word. That he was, got confidence in him over the spoken word, amen, so that he would have confidence over him with the unveiling of the word. Because speaking squirrels in existence may not bring me to rapturing faith, amen, but the opening of the seals did. The opening of the word did, amen. So I'm glad he passed the test and could handle the word of God that whatever he said would come to pass so that he could handle the word of God and reveal what was in the back part of God's mind laying there waiting to be expressed for this day because that's what's giving me rapturing faith. Look at 1 Kings 19. Let's look at Elijah. Now we're not really doing this to look at Elijah or Elisha, or Brother Branham, we're really trying to look at ourselves. We really want to find out how we should be operating in the day and age that we live in. 1 Kings 19, verse 9, or verse 8, we're going to start at verse 8. But before that, we know uh, Elijah just went through Mount Carmel, amen, he come through the Mount Carmel showdown, he, he has... Uh, uh, declared the word of the Lord. He's rebuilt the temple. Amen. He's withstood uh, uh, the false prophets. He's withstood the false church. Amen. And then Jezebel makes a threat and he runs for his life. And Brother Branham calls him his tired servant and goes under the juniper tree out in the wilderness all by himself. And he even, he even wants to die. He's so tired and, he, and he's so persecuted and he's so tried and he's so pressed. Amen. So God comes down and brings an angel, amen, to give him food, amen, and wakes him up and feeds him. And he can go on that strength. And, and we're going to pick this up just after that in verse 8. And he arose and he did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Now Horeb, amen, is where Moses had brought the people to, amen, to, to receive the Ten Commandments, amen, to receive the law of God. And they had come through Horeb and, and up on Mount Horeb, amen, is where they had the thunders and the lightnings and, and the mountain quaked, amen, and, and the fire came down. All of these things happened at Horeb, amen, and, and the tired servant, the tired prophet, under the strength that he got from an angel, amen, he went running back to Horeb. And we're going to find out that he's going in the wrong direction. He went to Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? He was back in a cave in the mountain of God where all of these wonderful things had taken place, amen, where God had showed himself mighty, where the mighty prophet had stood there and God had done exactly what he said he was going to do and there was mighty manifestations and now he slipped into a cave. He's hiding out from the world. He's hiding out from all the pressure. He's hiding out from all the persecution. He's hiding out from all the tribulation, amen, and he's sitting back there and playing a tape. Because he can't handle the reproach and he can't, can't handle the pressure that's coming and can't handle standing out there, standing in a church with all the things that happen in a church, amen. All the rubs and all his iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend, amen. Can't, can't stand the pressure and can't bear the reproach for the word because I'll say something and somebody will disagree with me. I'm just going to go back to Horeb and I'm going to climb in a cave and I'm going to play a tape again. Going back to where God did mighty things, going back to where the fire fell and the earth did quake, amen, and, and the wind blew and parted the Red Sea. There's nothing wrong with playing a tape at home. I do it all the time. But not to escape the pressures, amen, not to escape the pressure cooker that God put us in. And sometimes the pressure cooker God puts us in is in an assembly of believers. Yeah to mold our character, to try us, amen, to pressure us to see how we'll respond. 
<laughs> hey, Amen. So he goes back and he hides in the cave and the word of the Lord comes to him and says, what doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? God's not saying, oh, you arrived, good boy. You're back to where I wanted you. I wanted you back in Horeb. If he wanted him back in Horeb, he would have been there that day when the fire fell on Horeb the first time when Moses was there. But he didn't want Elijah in Horeb. He wanted him out there testifying his word before the people. <clears throat> Amen. This is Elijah's response. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. So what? That's a human emotion response. That's a human being, and every one of us are human beings last time I checked. And that's exactly what comes first, amen? You get pressed, I mean, you get tried, you get rejected, you get persecuted under the trials from God. The first thing he says is, I've been faithful, I did this, they did that. If you've never heard that in your own head, then you better, I don't know, wake up, amen, come to life, amen, because that's what happens all the time. Amen, I, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. All of that's true. There's nothing untrue about what he said. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 11, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. God doesn't give him an answer. He says, just go stand forth upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, behold the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break the pieces Break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. What are you looking for, Elijah? What are you looking for? You're looking for what happened on Horeb the first time? Are you looking for the first exodus? Are you looking for the waters to be parted by a strong and mighty wind? Are you looking for the earth to quake? Are you looking for the cloud to descend and the fire to fall? That's happened, amen? You've got a commission, move forward. What are you doing here? Amen, come stand here. All right, if you want wind, you got wind. But I'm not in it. You want the altars full, you can have the altars full, but that doesn't mean he's in it, amen. You want the loudest shouting, you can have the loudest shouting, it doesn't mean he's in it. You can have signs and wonders, and it doesn't mean he's in it. You can go back to a prayer line and replicate what the prophet of God does, it doesn't mean he's in it. What are you looking for? What are you doing here? Why are you going back to Horeb, amen? I gave you angels food. And that strength was strong enough to get you through, amen, for the 40 days of troubles. And you use that strength to go back to Horeb. You should have taken the strength that came from the meal from the angel and made it through the 40 day troublesome period and went back to the commission you were called to do. So he, he shows him the wind. So strong it breaks the rocks. My goodness, the Pentecostals would have had an absolute fit right then. I would have had a fit, let's just bring it home. I would have said, oh it's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. God wasn't in it. Then the earthquake, God wasn't in it. Then the fire, God wasn't in it. Oh, if it could just be like when Brother Brennan was here. 
that doesn't mean God will be in it. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. This word still means whisper. A whisper. Brother Bram said, great things happen in silence. And he's using this analogy. He says, he says, millions of gallons of water can evaporate off the earth every day and make less noise than it takes you and I to fill a bucket full. He said, the earth is turning. Have you ever heard it? It's not always the noise and the flash and the glamour that's God. Sometimes it's the everyday little whisper of his voice and submitting to his word that God is moving mightily in our lives. Still is a whisper and small is described as a, a thread, thin like a thread or gaunt. Very thin and feeble, amen, and easily broken, amen. And, and now there comes a whisper, thin voice. And after the fire, a still, small voice and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Man, it didn't get his attention. I mean, God wasn't in the fire. God wasn't in the earthquake. But that still small voice moved him to take his mantle, cover his face. It brought him into humility. The, the earthquake didn't bring him into humility, Amen. The, the wind didn't bring him into humility. The fire didn't bring the prophet into humility. But when he heard that still, small voice, all of a sudden, he covered his face with his mantle, and he went out to hear from the Lord. And Brother Bram said, what is the voice of God? He said, his word is his voice. Amen. <clears throat> And sometimes that word lays there, amen, in a tape or it lays there on a book, amen, and it's not the thing that's shaking and rattling your windows right then, amen. It's not the thing that's getting the most attention. It's the, not the dominant noise in your life, amen, but sometimes it's just laying there quietly. But his word is his voice. And the word of God brought him into humility. And he covered his face. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face with his mantle <coughs> and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? We come right back to the same question, amen. He asked him when he gets there, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he says, oh, the Israel's done this, and I've been jealous, and I've been faithful, and they sought my life. And he says, stand out here on the mountain. Fire, wind, earthquake, God on it. Then a still small voice. Then Elijah moves out in humility and he asks them the question again What are you doing here? Did you come looking for wind? Did you come looking for earthquakes? Did you come looking for fire upon Mount Horeb? What did you do? And Elijah is just exactly like you and I. He doesn't get the point. Just exactly like you and I. Behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I even, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He comes right back to the same grumbling, complaint, human perspective, uh, and, my, and my misery, and my wallowing, and I'm so pitiful, and won't you feel sorry for me, God? Oh my goodness. That's exactly how we pray. Oh God, why don't you feel sorry for me? God, why don't you? He didn't feel sorry for you when that crossed his desk and he signed off on it. Why would he feel sorry for you later when you're crying under it, amen? Because God has a purpose in it. And his purpose, amen, is for good, not for evil. His purpose is to strengthen us, not weaken us. His purpose is to move us into his commission, not to move us out. 
I say that, and tomorrow if something happens, I'm gonna go right back to the same thing. God, I've done this and I've done that. Don't you see what's happening to me? But let the word of God change our dialogue, enter into our mind, and begin to say, oh God, I'm thankful that you saw fit to allow this to happen. I don't understand it, but I believe there's a purpose, amen, and though I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. We need to start changing, amen, in the, from a human perspective and human love to moving up a little bit higher and not saying, God, why hast thou done this? God, don't you love me? God, don't you see? Of course he loves you. Of course he sees, amen. Of course he signed off on it. So let's not waste our time in those things. Let's get down to the word and say, God, there's a purpose in all of this. Would you reveal to me your purpose, Lord? Let me move where you want me to move. Let me respond the way. Let the very life of Jesus Christ flow through me in the midst of this trial. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm alone and left, and they seek my life to take it away. So now... Now, if, if, if the Bible was written by a human being, it would be pinned the next verse, God would say, I know my child, it's okay. I understand and I love you. And everything's gonna work out and I'm gonna pay them back for every dirty thing they did to you. And I'm about to pour a shower of blessings upon your head. And it's gonna be, you stay right here, I'll send more angels to feed you and you've done enough. That's not how the Bible's written. He goes back to the same old, they've done this and I've done this and all this is happening to me. He comes back and here's God's response now. He never addresses the issue. He said, and the Lord said unto him, go, return on thy way to the wilderness. Get back to work. What are you doing here? Get back to work. Go thy way to the waters of Damascus. He's all the way south of Israel, and God is going to send him on a journey that will take him all the way through Judah and Israel, all the way up to Damascus and Syria. He's not saying go around your troubles. I mean, he's not saying I understand you stay down here. He's putting him right back in the problem. Hallelujah. It's like you've been in the ring fighting out and you get knocked around and you got beat up real bad, amen, and you fall against the ropes when the bell tolls and you start telling your manager, your trainer, I'm so tired, he's hitting me so hard, he's stronger than I am, he's faster than I am, I can't do it, and your trainer says, shut up, bell dings, and he throws you back in the ring again. Because he's trained you for it. He knows what you can do, amen. He knows you're just in a moment of weakness, amen. You're just a little tired. But if you get back there and rely on your training, you got the knockout punch, amen. You got what it takes when you stand on the word, amen. God's not going to say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You come over here. Sometimes he says, what are you doing? Why are you sitting there sucking on a pacifier? complaining about the very thing I sent to give you victory. Haven't you read Revelations, amen, chapter two and three, all the promises that are to the overcomer? I want to give you those. So you have to be an overcomer. You can't get the promise unless you're an overcomer. And you can't be an overcomer unless there's something to overcome. God in his great love is going to make sure that we get the overcomer's prize by being overcomers, by having something to overcome. Remember, Brother Branham said in the the question, why does God stand by? When he sees, he says, I know thy suffering, I know thy tribulation, I know thy poverty, then why does he stand by? Because the next verse says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. Why does he stand by? Because he said, if you suffer with him, you can reign with him. Do you want to reign with him? Then you must accept suffering for his name's sake. You must accept suffering for his name if you want to reign with him. Why does God let it happen? Because you're ordained to reign. 
Oh God, let the water of the washing of your word wash away all my old thinking, my traditions, my humanism. Lord, kill this old stinking brain of mine and give me the mind of Christ that sees the word the way it's written, not the way I think it should be. and starts to view my life the way you see it, not the way I think it should be. We use words like not fair. <laughs> And really, talking to God, this isn't fair. Oh my goodness. The very judge of heaven and earth, the very, the very personage of justice, and tell him it's not fair. To say things to God like, how can you? My goodness, we should put our hands over our mouths and repent. How can you let this happen to me? Amen. We've all said it. Every one of us have been there. If we haven't said it, we thought it. But we should repent and say, God, forgive me for that. I know how you can because of your divine love for me. That's how you can. Hallelujah. This wouldn't work in a common community church. This kind of preaching wouldn't last long. They've been petted and stroked and babied and told they're wonderful, wonderful in your chopped off hair, wonderful in your earrings, wonderful in your rock and roll music, wonderful in your adultery. You've just been wonderful. Because you come to church, you're wonderful. We want no suffering for you, so the church will preach nothing that makes you suffer. We won't require anything from you that causes any persecution. We won't require that you follow the word because the world doesn't understand and we don't want your feelings hurt. My, that's not the gospel. That's perversion, that's deception, that's a lie. What's being preached in pulpits across the world is a lie. Amen. So he says in verse 14 again, he's complaining, he's telling God his situation in verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and then thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So God comes down and does not soft stroke Elijah. <clears throat> does not even acknowledge his complaint. But he comes down and he says, you go back. You've come down here. You've run from your troubles. You've run away from the commission and calling that I've called you to, but you go back. And when he goes back, he gives him three things to do. Anoint a new king in Samaria, a new king in Israel, and Elisha to be prophet in his room in his stead. So he goes back, back in the commission, and after he gives him the commission, he just says, you go back. You go back. And after he tells him to go back, he says, oh, and by the way, there's 7,000 that I've reserved unto myself. Your little misnomer of I'm the only one. See, God's not petting him. He's not stroking him. He's giving him the truth, amen? He's sending him back in his commission, and he's giving him a revelation. You're not the only one. You're not the only one who's held a standard. You're not the only one who hasn't bowed to Baal. Amen, all this crying, I'm the only one. I've done this. Your whole foundation is false, Elijah. God is gonna take the truth to break our misunderstandings. He's gonna take the real, true, living word to break us, amen, until we come to the reality of the truth, amen. We're not the only ones who've ever suffered. We're not the only ones who suffered like we're suffering now. Amen. We're not the only ones out there who really believe. We're not the only ones. Amen. God breaks us. Now, Brother Branham comes to this testing also. It's amazing how this spirit of Elijah 
comes to Elisha and a double portion. John the Baptist down to Brother Branham. And we see Brother Branham's trial with those in wickedness and ludity down there who are mocking and scored, or mocking, amen, <coughs> in the meetings. And he's given the power to say whatever he wants. If he'd have said two she bears, there would have been two she bears. But he said, I forgive you. He now was operating under an Elijah ministry as in the Jesus Christ anointing. And he said, I forgive you. <clears throat> and now he comes to a message standing in the gap and referred to it last time, but in the message standing in the gap, he had had his Mount Carmel showdown. He had preached the seals. And when he preached the seals, he declared that this ministry is Revelation 10.7. This is Malachi 4. This is all those things we wondered at and probed at and thought it was. This is it. He comes to Mount Carmel and said, this is it. This is the truth. Now everything else is a lie. It's all Baal. It's all, it's all wrong now. And, and, and he comes and he declares it. And when he preaches the seals, amen, it marks that there's time no more for denominations. Denominations has ended. The church age be, being liberated through the church ages is done now. He's finished with that. Now he's moving on to the next dispensation. So he has his Mark Car Mount Carmel showdown. And then he comes and he starts to feel sorry for himself. Brother Branham said, I built up a complex. Who built his complex? It wasn't his daddy. It wasn't his mommy. It wasn't the people who've heard him. It wasn't the experience he had as a child. He built his own complex. I've got a complex. Who's building it? Stop building the complex and start accepting the word. I built up a complex, he said. Now, Brother Bam's now driving along, and we talked about this last week. We know the story quite well. He wants to go up to the wilderness, and he wants to be a guide for Bud Southwick up in La near Alaska. And he just wants to stomp out and and, and he says, I was really doing that for my own selfish, I, so I could hunt. And, and I was going to trap my wife into it. I mean, I love the honesty of a prophet of God. Just come and just lay it bare. I was going to trap my wife. He, said, he says in another quote, he says, I was going to take her up there on a little trip and say, oh, it's so nice up here, let's just stay. Wow, that would have been exciting for her. So he's going along, and he's feeling sorry for himself. Because he said, I thought they should have heard my message. And it's true. They should have. They rejected it. That's true also. They persecuted him. They rejected him. They mocked and made fun of him. That's all true. And he's going out here, and he's driving along, and God's starting to show him that, uh, that, that dream that he had. He, he was reflecting back on a dream that he had, that he was a bum with Fletcher Broy, and Fletcher was trying to find him a place to sleep, and he got going through all of these things, and, and then Brother Brenham goes into that diner, and in the diner, he sees those two old men get up and go pay for it, two old bums, and he sees it's him, about 75 years old, and Fletch Broy, Fletcher Broy. And even Billy Paul says something, so they go on, and he's driving down the road, and Billy falls asleep, and he's going down the road, and God starts to speak to the prophet. Not in thunder, not in lightning, he just starts to talk to his prophet. And he says, what are you doing here? He doesn't use those same words, but what is he doing? God has now entered into his thinking. Brother Branham hadn't run to a cave on Horeb, but he had run to a cave within himself, amen? And he was wanting to get away from the people and he had lost his feeling for the people, amen. And he was willing to leave the ministry that God gave him to stomp, to go out into the woods so he can hunt and trap and grow his beard out and grow his hair down and be the kind of man he always wanted to be. But that's not what God wanted him to be. And God comes right down into his cave. And he virtually asks him, what are you doing here? What are you thinking? Brother Brenham hadn't told anybody. God is in the cave with him saying, where are you at? What are you thinking about? 
What are you considering doing? And he says, if you go through with your plans, your wife will leave you and you'll be a bum. And Brother Ram comes down and he starts talking and standing in the gap and he starts to say, I had a commission and a calling and I had more gifts than just an Old Testament prophet. I had gifts in the apostolic manner. All the gifts were minister, ministering and I was out to do more. I was praying for the sick and preaching the word. Amen, I wasn't just an Old Testament prophet and God began to show me, amen, that I was leaving the people led and I began to recognize that I wasn't operating in my commission. And what did God come down and do? He come down to that prophet. That prophet wants to go back to be what his childhood dream was, amen. He wants to go back to be an Old Testament prophet. But God says, what are you doing here, amen? This is not where I want you. Go back to work. Sends him right back to the people who rejected him, right back to the people who mocked him, right back to the people who refused the word. See, he was tested with both and he overcooked both. He, he come back standing in gap and he starts saying, I'm praying that I'll get that feeling for the people. I don't have it like I should. I need to go <coughs> back out. <laughs> How many is thankful he went back out? How many is thankful you have the tapes from the summer of 63 to 65? When he begins to go out in this commission, amen, and no longer is he casting the net for all who will come in. Now he's fishing for rainbow trout with the third pool, amen. I'm so excited that we got those tapes from summer of 63 to the end of 1965 where God sent him back out in a commission. But we realize when Elijah was in the cave and he was told what to do, he's given three things. But Elijah, in his person, only finished one. But it was in the Elisha ministry that Elijah's commission was finished. And now we find that that prophet was sent back out with a commission to get back to the people, amen, to get the message out, to get a gift of healing out, amen, to get the word of God out. And he was sent right back into the masses, right back into the people, amen. And that's why Brother Bam never told us to build communes or pull out of society and cut ourselves off, amen, because that commission was right back to the people who would reject, because Brother Bam said, because in there is some of God's children. And now Elijah's gone, but that commission is still rolling on, and it's rolling on in the Elisha ministry in the bride, and God has sent her right back into the people, amen. Right back to the co-workers and family members and people on the street. Amen. What do they need? Amen. They need a gift of healing. They need the word of God. Amen. They need the message of the hour, and that's the commission continuing on. We can't call she bears out because as long as the bride here there's still mercy available amen there's still blood on this earth because the church is the blood of Jesus Christ by the spirit of God amen and there's still a mercy seat present there's still a place for repentance there's still an opportunity here we're not here to call she bears yet those two prophets in Revelation 11 will take care of that we're here to call people to Jesus Christ to the word. They need a gift. They need the ministry. They need us. We can't hide out. Amen? We can't throw stones. We've got to stay in the calling. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's go back and I want to look at Romans chapter 5 together. We're not getting very far very fast. Why well, should say we're getting far? We're not getting far according to my thinking. Thank God. <laughs> thank God. Whenever something happens contrary to my thinking, I say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Now I know it's better than what I had. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. Wow. 
This is changing our attitudes. We glory in tribulation also. Now that's a challenge. How many of us can glory in tribulation? It's hard, but if it's scriptural, we can do it. But not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. There's a process. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. There's a process God is taking us through. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Look at all those things. Those aren't just words you clip off in a Bible verse. But these are terrible things that come into the lives of people. I mean, let's just look at it for a second. Because so many times we clip through, yeah, I know that, I learned that when I was in Sunday school, and not taking the full impact of the words. Shall tribulation separate me? No. Shall distress or persecution or famine? None of these things can happen to a child of God. (laughs) Why is Paul mentioning if it's not possible? God wouldn't let any of that happen. Amen. God has let it happen for generations and eons, and he's continuing to let it happen. Just because we live in America and Laodicea doesn't mean that these things aren't happening and able to happen at any time. We can be tested with any one of these and a number of other things any time God deems it necessary. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword I think the Apostle Paul went through most of those. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Humans saying, if he loved us, he wouldn't let us go through that. No, we are conquerors through all of these things. We're conquerors through him that loved us. It's his love that gives us his spirit and his word to overcome them all. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the love of God is where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Where is Christ Jesus? In us. Where is the love of God? In us. Who is Jesus Christ? The Word made manifest. Where is it at? It's in us. What's in us? The love of God. It's the very love of God in us that brings persecution and tribulation and rejection. What brings it on? The love of God. The Word made manifest for this day, living and abiding in a bride, is the very thing that brings the persecution and the mocking and the scoffing and the rejection. Does God love us? Absolutely. He is love. Brother Bam says, and I want to wrap up with this thought and then we'll, we'll stop on page two. Hallelujah. And Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Listen to what the prophet says. This is God's great mystery of love expressed. So there's a mystery of God's love. And what is the expression of the mystery of God's love? This is God's great mystery of love expressed, that God and man became one. Now keep thinking, stay with me. See, the whole thing is God and man one. God and man was one there, and God and man is one here. What is the bride coming of Christ? The mystery of God's love expressed. This is God's 
great mystery of love expressed that God and man became one. God and man was one there. God and man is one, God and man is one here. What is it? Being filled with the Spirit, him having the preeminences. That was God's achievement that God, that's God's purpose to do that, that he might be in Christ, in Christ and us, and all of us together, one. This is the God's great mystery of love expressed. And everything God has ever done through the scriptures is with that love in mind. All the prophets, what were they doing? They were building the body. They were building the image of the son, amen? They were building the image, amen, until it was capped off in Jesus Christ himself. And everything that Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, everything that they were going through was pointing towards that, amen? They were building up the word of God from the feet to the legs to the thighs all the way up until it was capped off in the headship of Jesus Christ. And all through the New Testament, through seven church ages, it's been building up what? The second part of that image, which is the bride part. And everything they went through the church ages is what? It's God's love being expressed because what is the great mystery of God's love expressed? God and man one. He did it in Christ Jesus, but it built up through the entire Old Testament. Then he did it now in his bride and he's been building it up through the New Testament. And everything he does is with that in mind. Every decision, every trial, every persecution, everything that's happening is happening with that objective. Because Brother Branham said, God had a threefold plan and purpose that he purposed within himself before the foundation of the world. And everything he's done has been working to this purpose. That God would get preeminence in a man, and he did that in Christ Jesus. And that God would get preeminence in a body of believers and he's doing that now in the bride. And that he would restore them back to Eden condition. Why are you suffering? Because it's the mystery of God's love expressed. Why are you persecuted? Why are you ridiculed? Why are you scoffed at? Why are troubles coming? It's the mystery of God's great love being expressed. Everything is pointing to this purpose, this plan. And I say, God, let it shine through me. Whatever it takes, let it shine through me. Brother Lonnie preached the message years ago. I've never forgot it. Years and years ago. Because I was an electrician at the time, it really stood out to me. But Brother Lonnie was showing how you take a light bulb, a regular old incandescent light bulb. I mean, the ones that have become antique in the last year. Two years. It's got a filament in it. And that filament originally was made out of carbon, something that's not very conductive at all. I mean, something that's conductive is like a straight piece of metal. It conducts electricity like a flash. Something that's resistant would be like wood. It doesn't conduct electricity very well. So they take carbon that doesn't, doesn't, does not transmit electricity really well, and they would put it between two powers, amen, a positive and a negative power, and the electricity would flow through that. And because, because that that filament would resist the power. When it resisted, it began to glow and produce light. And you and I have been placed in this world to resist this world and the powers of darkness that are in this world. And we got stuck here, amen. And the power, amen, trying to, to take us over. If we'll just resist it, It'll shine light. Why are these things coming? So that we can resist it, so that we can overcome, so that we can shine the light of the gospel. I want to end with this thought where we're talking about this is God's great mystery of love expressed, that God and man have become one. God and man was one there, and God and man is one here. And Brother Brenham has an interesting set of circumstances or, or statements that he makes that I just want to hone in on and then we'll dismiss for, the, for today. He says in the True Easter Seal in 1961, he's referring to something that happened at the end of preaching. He was preaching and then Danny Henry come up and put his arms around him and when he put his arms around him, he spoke in French. 
When he spoke in French, there was three people there that were able to give an interpretation. There was a, a French woman from Louisiana, another man, uh, Victor Ledoux, and then there was a man from the, from the United Nations who was an interpreter for the United Nations. They all wrote down the interpretation, and Brother Branham is going into that here in 1961 in the True Easter Seal. He says, now here now, this, this man, now watch how it's wrote. You see, it's wrote in foreign words. Thou hast picked the correct and precise decision, and it's my way. <coughs> Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven waits thee. Now this is a prophecy over Brother Branham, amen? And, and he says, thou has, has picked the correct and precise decision, and it's my way. So God has, never, God has never trampled over free moral agency, amen? Even the prophet of God had to make his choice. And he made the right decision, and he said, it's my way. Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven waits thee. <clears throat> a huge portion of heaven waits thee. What a glorious decision thou hast made. This in itself. And Brother Branham said, now here's from here on I don't understand. Brother Branham injects that. From here on I don't understand. This in itself, this in itself is that which will give and make come to pass the tremendous victory in the love divine. What is divine love? The love of God. Amen. This is what we're talking about, the love of God misunderstood. Now he's saying, thou hast made your choice, thou hast taken the word and the word only, it's my way, it's a tremendous decision, All a, a great portion of heaven awaits you. And Brother Bram said he didn't know about the vision, and Brother Bram's referring to when he went beyond the curtain of time and saw all his converts to Christ. A huge portion of heaven awaits thee. And he says, this in itself will bring to pass the tremendous victory in love divine. So there's something that when he made a decision to stay on the word, something's going to come later that is a tremendous victory in divine love. And he says, I don't know what this means. Listen to what he says. He starts to probe. I don't know what this means. This will make come to pass, perhaps in the little tent one of these days. Sitting back yonder, he'll make it known. What is the tent vision? It's the vision of the third pool coming. What is the third pool? The opening of the word. So he says, I don't know what this means, but perhaps in the little tent one of these days. Hallelujah, the prophet was nailing it. He was getting right to it. What's going to bring the tremendous victory in divine love? Amen, it's gonna be the opening of those seals. It's gonna be the capstone coming. What is the capstone? Charity, love, divine love. What is it? The person himself. What is the great mystery of God's love expressed? God and man becoming one. Amen. If you don't catch as God's love, that it's charity, it's divine love that's coming to unite God and man becoming one, we've missed the love of God, the whole purpose, amen? He says in Paradox, the end of 1961, <laughs> speaking of the same thing, just against, I'd have to walk by yourself, I can understand that Moses had to make his choice too. He didn't have to do it, but he did it. The harder way thou, because thou hast chosen the narrow path, the harder way thou has walked of your own choosing. In other words, I didn't have to do it. I can side in and go with them if I want to. Go with the denominations, go with all the brethren. I can side in and go with them if I want to. But I stayed with, I want to stay with the word. Thou hast picked the correct and precise decision and it is my way. If you notice, it's punctuation and underline. If you notice, it's wrote in French. Spoken French, verb before the adverb, see? Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven awaits thee. Now that's what I wondered, when I die, will it be? Then, it ha then I happen to think, heaven's not portioned off to different portions to us up there. Heaven's the kingdom of heaven that's within us, one waits for. Now watch, what a glorious decision thou hast made. This it's in itself is that which will give and make come to pass the tremendous victory in the love divine. See, we say it in the tremendous victory in divine love, but in the French, it would be love divine, just like German or any other. They, get, they put the verb before the adverb. Now you see what, what coming down to Jordan meant? Now he's taking this, 
Now he's taking, you've made the right decision. This will bring to pass the tremendous victory and love divine. And he's tying it with coming down to Jordan. Now he just tied it to the tent vision, the third pull, and now he's tying it to coming down to Jordan. See, you see what coming down to Jordan meant? We're down here now, let's cross over now. Let's quit playing, let's cross the other side because it all belongs to us, it's all ours. Then visions have never failed. They can't fail because they come from God. I believe it with all that is within me. We're not the hireling that will run back into the wilderness. We'll cross Jordan, the separation. What's Jordan? The separation. What was crossing Jordan? Moving into the open word. Moving into the opening of the word, the third pull, the seals revealed, the whole mind of God being revealed is crossing Jordan. Listen, he says it. We'll cross Jordan, the separation. God, break to us the seals that's on the back of the book. He's still talking about the great victory, tremendous victory and divine love. Your decision is what's going to bring to pass the tremendous victory and divine love. What was his decision? To stay with the word, to take the narrow way, the harder way, and it'll bring this tremendous victory in divine love because what is God's mystery of love expressed? God and man becoming one. Hallelujah. God break to us those seals. He's talking about crossing Jordan. Breaking to us those seals on the back of the book. What's that? The seven thunders. Let us enter into this great place now for Joshua divided to the people their inheritance that God had left for them. Brother Branham now is explaining to us what is this tremendous victory in divine love? It's the capstone. It's charity at the top of the pyramid. Seven virtues. The one next to that is brotherly kindness. Oh, how deceptive that can be. We think brotherly kindness is the same as God's love. But brotherly kindness is a virtue. It's godly. It's right. But it's not yet arrived. Amen? Because the the great mystery of God's love expressed is when God and man become one, when divine love comes down at the opening of the word, when when not just a baptism in the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit himself, amen, and the person comes down and unites with a body of believers on earth. That is the tremendous victory in divine love. And everything God is doing is pointing to that capstone, pointing to this union, amen, and bringing that out of us. If it's persecution, it's divine love, amen. If it's trials and scourgings and mocking, it's God's love expressed, amen, because that's his whole purpose. That's what he's had in his mind before the foundation of the world, the one desire that he's wanted to express. Divine love isn't petting and stroking. It's whatever puts the capstone in place. Whatever puts the capstone in place in your life and whatever puts the capstone in place in my life is God's divine love. And anything that'll diminish from that capstone is evil. Because this is God's great mystery of love expressed. To deny it is evil. To take away from it is evil. To hide it is evil. But everything God's doing is pointing to that capstone. Charity. Agape love. Husband and, husband and bride coming together. Bridegroom and bride. Because we didn't understand the love of God. They didn't understand that God was election. Not all these circumstances. All these circumstances is working out his foreordained plan. And so now, when you see the capstone, and you see the tremendous victory in divine love, everything else just fades away. If God wants to express this union in me, and he wants to do it by pushing me, pressing me, scourging me, I say, God, let it reflect right here. Let your great mystery of love express be reflected right here. And everything you do has that in mind. Help me to have that in mind. 
Help me to keep that, that everything you're doing has to do with this third pool. Amen. Everything we've ever been through has to do with that, friends. Every, every path that you've taken, every trouble that's come in your life, that's come in mine, all has this purpose in mind, that God would dwell in you. That is divine love, is tremendous victory in love divine would be expressed on this planet today. Let's get back out and work. Let's go back to work. Let's finish the commission that was given to Elijah. Amen, and standing in the gap. I let the sick people lay. I stood away from them, they wouldn't hear the message. Have we withheld from people because they wouldn't hear the message? Have we drawn back because we felt like they should have believed what we had to tell them? I have. I say, God, help me get right back out there. And if they won't hear it, the next person will. If they won't hear it, the next person will. But let me be found faithful in doing what thou hast called me to do. I don't want to be back in a cave. I don't want to be back hiding out from the world. I want to be right there standing toe to toe with the devil and Satan's Eden and challenging him on every turn, challenging him in sickness, challenging him in every situation and every power of the enemy. I want to take it to task and challenge it with, through deception, through lies. I want to challenge it. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Let's all stand. We'll stop there. I still haven't got to the third way. And with, maybe Wednesday. You just pray that God will have his way. Musicians, if you can make it forward. Let's pray, guys. God will move us. And God will lead us. Teach us what we ought to be doing today. Amen. To show us what love really is and what it's not. To help us not confuse human love with divine love. Help us to keep it straight, and let's just stay straight with this word, amen? amen? Even if I don't understand it, there may be times the word makes a request that is contrary to human love. What a, we mentioned this last time, but could you imagine being the man who said, oh, Jesus, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my, dead, my dad. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Preach the kingdom. Sometimes the love of God is contrary to human love. I said, God, don't let me make that mistake again. Let me stay with your word and your word only. Amen. Oh, God, help me not to get confused. Help me not to feel sorry for myself. Amen. If there's one thing that I would love to kill in myself is that old desire to feel sorry for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I wish so bad that I could, that thing could just eliminate out of me and die out of me to where I quit feeling sorry for myself, quit feeling like I, I should be treated better, or quit feeling like things like this shouldn't happen to me. Oh my goodness, if, if we look in reality, I deserve so much worse than I've ever gotten. I should have been scourged and persecuted and raked over the coals and crucified a long time ago. If I could just get rid of that and quit this urge to fight back and this urge to run away and just stay true to the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. Not for strife, amen, amen. Not to, to escape the world and go build a commune, but just stay with the word and preach it and deliver it and share it and live it and reflect it every day of my life. Say, God, let me live. That's divine love expressed. Let everything in my life point to that, oh God. I know you're with me on that. I know that's our desire. And let's just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word that is so real and so true. God, it begins to reveal to us, Lord, all our faults, Lord, all our shortcomings. But you know those things before you called us, Lord. Before we had faults, you called us. Before we had shortcomings, our complexes, you called us. You ordained it from before the foundation of the world. And God, you want us to overcome those things, Lord. You're desiring that we overcome complex. We go past uh, selfishness and self-desire, feeling offended and feeling hurt. Lord, that we move past those things and stay true to the calling wherewith you've called us. We saw your apostle Paul do it. We saw Peter do it. We saw you do it when you come in flesh. We saw your prophet do it in this day. And God, now we're asking that you would strengthen us, that we might be able to stand the same way, stand true to the word against all odds, and stay in the firing line no matter what happens, Lord. God, let human love not get confused with your perfect love. 
Let your perfect love be our motivation every day. Lord, we give you glory and honor. We trust in you, Lord, and know that your hand is perfect, that your will is perfect, and we now submit ourselves unto your hand, that you can do with us as you wish, that you strengthen us and use us, Lord. We are your tools in this day. We are your mouthpiece in this day. We are the lamp that is shining light in this day. We just pray, God, that we'd be faithful to that calling. Jesus, mold us. Mold us and make us more like you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, saints. Old devil gets a black eye. I've been coughing my head off and I coughed hardly at all while I was preaching. And preaching makes it worse. Take that, devil. Amen. If I get scars in my throat, I'll say I kind of like that. (laughs) Amen. Being scarred in the service of my Lord. I love you. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate the pull on the word. Amen. These things aren't the things that make us feel comfortable and living the way we've lived. It makes us feel uncomfortable with ourselves. But there's something very comfortable about the word of God. That though it's gorgeous, Though it shear us, though it fillet us, though it expose us, there's something so comfortable about it that says, that's the truth. Uh, uh, My my backside hurts. I just got the spanking in my life. But oh, it feels good in a weird sort of way. Because the word is true. And that's what we really want. We love you. God bless you. Go from here encouraged to keep pressing the battle. Staying with the word. You have a song, brother. Yeah, let's sing this song, Who I Am. Oh, glorious victory. That day he set me free. And he made my heart his very
revelation, it's predestination.